Hi, I'm Naisha McCauley, and you're watching AccessTV.org. Good morning, this is Jonathan Small, host and producer of All About You. This program is broadcast every week from AccessTV.org studios in downtown Hartford. And this show is designed to give the guests a chance to give their life story. This morning I have a world's famous artist visiting here from uh, New York and he's pretty much going to give his life story as an artist and also as a television uh, producer. This morning my guest is Mike Singletary. Good morning, Mike. How you doing? I'm doing great. I'm really happy to be here. Okay, it's thank good you. to have you here too. Okay, well thank you. Okay, could you gotta let people know exactly where you were born and raised? I was actually born in Harlem and I grew up in the South Bronx mm -hmm. in New York. What was it like growing up in Harlem in the South Bronx? It was fascinating. It was mm -hmm. it was always something to do. It was nothing really negative about it. You know, people used to always come to Harlem, like especially like on a Sunday, mm -hmm. to sort of just go and hang out, and it was just a great place to be for me. Mm -hmm. um, and the same thing with the Bronx too. I enjoyed that because it was so multicultural mm -hmm. and fun. I had a fun time growing up. And also, the South Bronx is labeled the birthplace of hip hop. But I know you're an artist. Um, was you in the South Bronx during the hip hop? Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah. I mean, I, I was a teacher back then. Mm -hmm. I didn't really gravitate to hip hop until much later because I love music and I like the continuation of music. But I had a hard time with hip hop. Mm -hmm. Some of the hip hop, but you know, just like anything that's art. Um, some of it's good and some of it wasn't good. And then as I, I did a whole art series called The Chocolate Hip Hop mm -hmm. because I started getting to know a lot of the hip hop artists and um, I did this exhibit and it was called The Chocolate Hip Hop and it was just wonderful because I think a lot of it had to do with just being able to understand exactly what they were trying to do and what they were trying to say and then later i just started getting into hip-hop really really heavy very much like i did with the jazz mm -hmm. series so you like the jazz music you got into hip-hop um a little bit later uh in your era i believe the 60s or the 70s new york is about two hours from philadelphia where did you like the philly sound i like all, all music the, okay. i love music all right, i love all right. music and i love good things that are art okay and anything that's art, I mean, I love classical music. And, okay. You know, and I, I studied in um, Europe. At one time, I wanted to be a musician mm -hmm. until I realized how much discipline it took to be mm -hmm. a musician. And I studied, fortunately, with um, at Fountain Blue Music and Fine Arts Conservatory. And I was a Dan Rhodes Scholarship um, person. And I think the last person of color that was a damn roots person was Herbie Hancock. Mm -hmm. So I felt very honored to be um, in that whole grouping. And the um, master teacher at that time was Aaron Copeland. And um, it was just a one. And Mademoiselle Boulanger who taught everybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, she taught everybody, Skravinsky's wife, Copeland, everybody, all the 20th century artists. So I grew up understanding and loving music, no matter what it was. And that's why I do a lot of, a lot of my music and my music themes are, my art themes are about music. Mm -hmm. But when did you actually get started uh, painting and doing artwork? Was it, what particular age level did you actually start doing the art? Someone asked me that question years ago. I think it was a Japanese producer. Mm -hmm. I think I got started, it's a really long kind of complicated story, but to shorten it, I think that I, I, I'm, I was born in January, so my mother always told me when I would get to be five years old, I would go to school. And when I reached five years old, you know, when you're five years old, you have to wait another four months, but I did four or five months in order for you to enroll because it was a whole new year. Mm -hmm. And, um, I uh, they, I was told that, you know, you can't go to school even though you're five years old, and I can never understand that. So what I did was to pass my time away because there was no daycare centers and no uh, places for kids to go. You had to stick with your mom. So what I did, I drew everything. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I traced everything. Like the, we had the big pictorial Bible, mm -hmm. and I just traced everything, and that's all I did all day. And then I think that was the first time I ever had any kind of exposure, even though it wasn't great work. I mean, I just wind up doing that sort of work. And then, like when I got into high, when I got into elementary school, I became the bulletin board person, mm -hmm. and I just did it, you know, because I just wanted to impress the teacher. But I um, just started developing talents because I knew how to enlarge paintings. I mean, drawings and superheroes and Superman and all that. Mm -hmm. But um, and then I just kept going. Mm -hmm. And then, like, when I got the third grade, I won every awards there was from that point on, like, in, in, in school. I mean, I was in all kind of exhibits. And, I, you know, the greatest thing that ever happened to me and that impacted me was they sent me to schools on Saturdays. Mm -hmm. And that was, like, my life for, from there. And all I did was just study art. And when they took us on field trips, um, they took it to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, but I wasn't interested in the armor and all that stuff they were showing us. Oh, yeah. My interest was those paintings, they were fabulous. I mean, it was Rubens and these huge paintings, and I used to always sneak off. And then I found out that I can get to the museum by myself, by just getting on the subway, and, and and going to the Met. So I used to live in the Met. I knew almost every gallery in the Met. Mm -hmm. But like my artist that I, of, of choice was Rembrandt. I mean, I saw a work that the museum had purchased. And I used to go to the museum, a Metropolitan Museum of Art, at least once or twice a week when I was like in the third and fourth grade. Mm -hmm. Sometimes my mom didn't even know about where I was going. I have a half a day I knew where I was going. I just It took me 16 exact minutes to take the train and get and get to the Met and then walk back home. So I just about spent all of my time at the Met. So you was kind of heavily involved with artwork, you said about the age of eight years old or going eight to and the nine years eight old. Eight nine I mean, I always knew I was going to be an artist, okay. always. You know, it was just one of those things where, and I was good at it. Mm -hmm. And I think I was good at it because I knew how to enlarge. There were some other young people that were as good mm -hmm. or maybe even better, but I just w had this incredible thirst for technique, and I wanted to learn the techniques of everybody. And, and I tried my best to do everything I could to learn as much technique on how to do realistic paintings and be, be a painter like a Rembrandt mm. and the Flemish artist. Now, eventually you would have to go to art school after graduating, or did you have any art schools when you was going to public school? Well, when I was uh, when I was 11 years old, I went to the New School for Social Research. Okay. And that's where I met Benny Andrews, a famous black painter. Mm -hmm. And he introduced me to everybody from Romeo Beard and, you know, and Ben Delaney, all these, uh, Huey Lee Smith. Mm -hmm. He introduced me to all of those major people. And, but... I used, it was like different environment. I went, the, the village in the 60s and the 70s was so entirely different than mm -hmm. it is now even. But I used to go to the new school for social research and that had a great impact on me because I learned how to do canvas and I also learned technique mm -hmm. on, how to, on how to stretch canvas and how to do canvas and to see the work and then at that time, the, the, the village was flooded with painters. I think they call them beatniks now. Mm -hmm. And it was just, there was art everywhere in New York. Right. I mean, there was portrait studios everywhere. And I used to just sit for hours just watching these guys paint. And then the guys that used to do um, the pastel art, you know, people, you know, that come in, you know, you know, you come in and you do your work. They were just um, phenomenal and I had a fantastic teacher they used to have what they call sorries where they would take your artwork and they would put it up and and you know people would come by and look at your works that was the first chance I had to see what it was to do in an exhibit mm -hmm. but at that exhibit I met some really powerful wonderful people mm -hmm. um, I met Sammy Davis Jr. which was like he was like Mike, the Michael Jackson of his day even bigger yes and I, when I met 
uh, Sammy Davis Jr. Because my father and everybody, and, you know, there was not that many black people on TV, and he was the only one that was there. Mm-hmm. And um, I know I was just like, that's got to be Sammy Davis Jr. And that was a big thrill for me. And he was just looking at my work, and he said, "Good luck," and you know, whatever they say. I didn't even know what he said. The only thing I knew, I didn't want to wash my hands for like a month. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it but, was just wonderful. Well, Mike, that had to be a lot of. Um, boost for your confidence at that stage to be meeting famous people like Sammy Davis Jr. and you know Ben Andrews and being into that type of exposure level did that do a lot for your confidence and did you start to see now that I could actually make a living as an artist no I didn't see none of that you know what the biggest impact I had meeting Jackie Robinson okay I was like my father grew up and that's all he talked about with Jackie Robinson Mm -hmm. and the first time I met him, um, I was shining shoes in, 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 in Manhattan, and there was this one guy that I used to always do his, it became a really good friend of mine. He said, look, Jackie Robinson works in our building, mm-hmm. 55 West, 42nd. And he said, would you like to meet him? I was like, what? You, you, I mean, it was just unbelievable for me. Mm-hmm. And then when I met him, you know, I don't know what he, again, I don't know what he said, but he had big impact on me because later on that year, later on, like maybe three or four years later, I, I had artwork at the New York City um, World's Fair, and he was there, and he was running it with the Singer Pavilion, and he said, oh, we meet again, and I was just like, wow, this guy still remembers who I was, and that was like one of the big impacts. But during that period, anybody that was doing anything black and positive I was influenced by. Mm-hmm. I wasn't necessarily influenced by people who were like artists, but okay. you know, I mean, it was people that were like entertainers. I mean, I loved all the stuff that came down from Motown and the Philly sound, mm-hmm. or anybody that was doing something on a positive level. I gravitated towards, mm-hmm. and I just felt wonderful about being a part of it. I mean, not so much meeting all of them, but being a part of anything that was like really positive and of course you know you know the Malcolm thing I see Malcolm X all the time like on uh, 125th Street and in, in, in a Hotel Teresa and then I was in the same area where we with Martin Luther King at one time when he came up north mm-hmm. and so you know it was a lot of those positive things that kept me really just active and wanting to do things. And then anybody that did anything positive, I mean, the Essence Magazine, when it came out, I was happy about that, happy about Black Enterprise. I was happy about anybody that was doing anything that was black, that was positive. Well, Mike Singletary, it seemed like to me in that era, you growing up in Harlem and the South Bronx, and there was some serious issues also, you know, with drugs and crime, but you said you were seeking for things kind of positive, so that definitely kept you focused and definitely kept you believing that there's a future, that I could be somebody, because I don't know what the mindset was for many kids that you grew up with in that particular time frame, but it seemed like to me, was it kind of rare that you was able to meet a lot of people at your age? No, 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 it was, um, first of all, I was an athlete. I was a really, really good athlete. And I, when I was growing up, people always said that there was always there was always these positive people that would say you can be anything you want to be, except for maybe the president. And okay. now that is, I mean, because I mean that was something that nobody even gave a thought to. But I was an athlete, and athletes stayed over here, and certain other people stayed here, and I just felt like I never really had to be a part of that that group that was doing a lot of the negative stuff. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, there was a lot of drugs. When I went first went to college, um, people, half of the people that I knew was dead. And I was like 18 years old. They would either die in Vietnam or they were dying off of drugs. Mm -hmm. And I just said, no, this would never be for me. Because my, my will to do art was so incredibly strong. And when I was really young, they, nobody ever told us that they are black artists. It wasn't until I went to the new school that I ran into Benny Andrews, who's a very fair-skinned you know, brother. And I, he introduced me to all these artists, and it was just a relief. And I always used to tell Benny, I said, you know, Benny, thank you so much for helping me. Because 
it took so much pressure off me because you know back in those days you know you know it was like you, you're the first and you do all this and I was just like I want to be the first black painter and all that pressure's going to be on me and I didn't need all that and I just really rather just play basketball to do something else but you know there was a lot of that and um I just didn't want to deal with the whole drug thing I mean it was there and it was, but it was all over the place. It was unbelievable how destructive it was. And but I always knew that it was. But then I was, I was always a church boy. Mm -hmm. My moms and my father, you know, they were church people, and we went to church sometimes three days a week. Mm -hmm. And you know, and right and wrong was very well understood by me. So, well, Mike Singletary, we up on our break. Uh, let's come back and kind of get into the second part of your life okay. and uh, television as a television and radio uh, producer. And we'll right. still mix a little bit of your art okay. career involved in the okay. whole mix. Uh, this is Jonathan Small. I'm hosting All About You this morning with my guest, famous artist Mike Singletary, and we will be right back very shortly. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here tonight to congratulate and support AccessTV.org. AccessTV.org has reached hundreds and thousands of people. It's done a great job informing the community about important issues in our city, our state, and our nation. I congratulate Stan McCauley and Naisha for the job they've done. And now on, with their new format, which will reach many more people, and which will be available through many more formats. The future is very bright for accesstv.org. Congratulations, and may you continue your mission of informing our community. Thank you very much. Hartford Public Schools. We care about one thing above all, the future of our kids. That's why we're dedicated to providing all students with the knowledge and skills needed in the new global culture. Hartford Public Schools is thriving. More student success stories, more world-class facilities, more university and corporate partnerships, more amazing talent coming and staying in Hartford. This is how education is supposed to work. Welcome to Hartford Public Schools, where the future is present. Good morning again. This is Jonathan Small. I'm hosting All About You this morning with my guest, uh, famous artist Mike Singletary, and we're going to get back into our conversation. Uh, Mike, we kind of left off about, you know, you being involved in church and how that was real instrumental towards your life, but also you was also involved in television and radio as a producer. Um, how did that opportunity come ar around for yourself? Well, I started off working in film. Mm -hmm. I always, I wanted to always do an extension of what I was as far as being an artist. And one of the things was open to me was theater. Mm -hmm. And I loved theater. And I always, I never wanted to act, but I wanted to do background scenes and I wanted to be a director because I thought he was, that was a culmination of everything that was art. Mm -hmm. Music, sound, everything that I loved, you know. And... I started working and, you know, also understand that during that period, there was no black nothing on television. There was no black nothing mm -hmm. on film, mm -hmm. I mean, on, on, in, in the movies. Mm -hmm. So I didn't expect to do anything. I was just doing it for the pure love of just wanting to do film. Mm -hmm. And um, the fortunate thing happened after 1968. I, 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 I went to a film school, WNET training school, where they taught black people the behind the scenes of film, mm -hmm. being uh, lighting directors and you know the behind the scene people. And um, it just so happened during that same period, all those black exploitation films got, came out mm -hmm. and you had a chance to work. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I worked like 20 hours a day half the time in these low-budget production horrible films, but I worked on them. And um, it's just, was this a wonderful thing to do? I mean, I met some great people, you know, uh, Samuel L. Jackson, Whitman Mayo, a lot of really great actors, because nobody was working. And then finally we get a chance to work, and we got a chance to work. And I wind up at CBS because... I, um, someone offered me a job and I was always looking for work, always because mm -hmm. I was freelance. And I got a job in journalism and I'm not a journalist. But CBS turned out to be somewhere, I, I said I would stay for like six months and I wound up staying there for like 35 years and it was just wonderful. I started off as a, basically as a desk assistant, you know, pulling copy for Walter Cronkite and those people. And, um, and then I wind up just becoming an AD, which is associate director, and I worked at CBS News and mm. Sports and NFL Today, and it, I had great three or four years, and then I got tired of it, mm. but Be because I wasn't doing my work. But that had to be kind of a tremendous honor from your neighborhood, because um, I would assume most uh, black young men growing up in Harlem in the South Bronx didn't really work at that level in Manhattan. Is that kind of correct? Or was that a little no, 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 no. It, it, it was it was incredible. Mm. I mean, and I felt it too because I was just like, when I first came in, they said, "Look, you're gonna be working with this guy." Mm -hmm. And I said, "Who's this guy?" And they said, "This guy is Walter Cronkite." And I said, "That's the guy from Dallas." I was just fascinated mm -hmm. because some of those original people that were at CBS, they were great writers, mm -hmm. and they were artists. I mean, I would sit sometimes, especially like when I worked in radio, and we would do like the shows, and I said. You know, there was always moments where, you know, you go, okay, we, got, we have to fill. And I said, they ain't going to be able to do this, and it's going to go down the tubes. Mm -hmm. But they lived the history. They were history. Yeah. And to be able to see them just do this, they made, for the first time, I really loved the whole idea of writers. Because writers can really make you feel what it was to be there. Mm -hmm. I mean, like when Walter, and like he had some great writers and he had, and he himself was a great writer, but to be able to be able to be with artists, and that's and that, that's why I said like working at CBS was like not even working at all because yeah. it was just like it was just a place that was just wonderful and the opportunities were always there and I just enjoyed it and I loved being a part of it. And um, it wasn't until later in life that I, you know I'm mean, even like when I wanted to say, look, I'm not spending enough time with my art, because I always did art. Mm. I was able to move completely out of television over the radio, which was a more intimate situation anyway for me. Mm. Now, now, Mike, did you still live in Harlem or the South Bronx, or did you move into Manhattan at that particular stage? No, I was actually living in Syracuse, because I went to university up there. Oh, okay. And um, when I came back to New York, it was a shock, mm -hmm. because everything has changed and things had gotten a little bit better. Okay. Just in terms of like a lot of the degradation that was going on in the neighborhoods, but mm -hmm. then there was always that. Mm -hmm. But um, but I mean, did the people that you grew up at, at uh, that that you had grew up with at that particular time frame, did you still socialize with the guys from? The I always did. Yeah. I always felt like we always had this need, and I was always taught, especially through church, that um, you always have to give back. Mm -hmm. And I felt always felt like people gave to me and I was very successful in a lot of areas and I always wanted to do it and that's why I became a teacher mm -hmm. and I taught for like two years at the New York City Board of Education and uh, they developed some programs on how to teach kids math through film and and that sort of thing mm -hmm. and it was successful for a minute but then I had to look and do what I had to do for me because mm -hmm. I just said, you know, people put it out there for me to do it. And I had a great opportunity to, to do something. Mm -hmm. And go ahead. But I mean, saying that the people that you grew up with, you're indicating that you gave back, you know, teaching and, and schooling. Mm -hmm. But I mean, just as you being successful at this stage of your life, meeting a lot of people like Walter Cronkite, 
did that kind of give the people that you grew up with that if I could make it from the same neighborhoods to be able to work at CBS, that they kind of look at their life, that they could possibly make it? I think that I influenced some people. Okay. I influenced some people because I would come back and I would like see some of these people and they lived in the same apartments, the same houses, and they took over their mother's homes and their apartments and et cetera. Mm -hmm. And it did make an impact, I think, for the younger people. Mm -hmm. And I talked with a lot of the young hip hop people and told them, I just said, you know, you just got to stay in school, get your paper, do what you got to do. And I think I did influence one or two people and I was able to help people. Mm -hmm. But uh, more I helped myself because I felt good, because I felt like I had contributed because people had did a lot for mm -hmm. me, like when I was growing up. I mean, people did a lot in terms of, um, motivating me. I mean, mm. like when I was growing up, people used to say, Mike, you gotta make it, you gotta do this, you gotta do, you're in a great opportunity. I mean, people always told me that. They right. said, you're in a great opportunity to do what you, but see, I always knew what I had to do, mm. which was more important than anything else. And I wanted to be like the people that were successful, that were black, and you know, and, and that, that's where I was. Now also in New York, you mentioned the black exploitation films like Shaft and Superfly. Those two films were actually filmed in New York. Were you able to be involved in those particular projects to be able to meet? Ron no, no, no. I, mean, I, I, I didn't meet them, but okay. you know, we were all in one one circle. Yeah, I mean, it okay. was just like everybody knew everybody. All right. It was just like the the the, the, the painters that that I met, some of the famous painters. I everybody knew anybody. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they lived in D.C. or they lived in New York City, mm -hmm. and you just kind of just knew people, mm -hmm. and. Um, and it was just something that was not organized, but people just knew each other. Okay. And um, I mean, I, I, I got a chance to meet with Ossie Davis. Mm -hmm. You know, he ran Third World Cinema. And they were, everybody was always, you know something? People always wanted to help you. Oh, okay. It seemed like, I mean, Roland Mitchell was one of the first black cinematographers in Hollywood. I mean, they wanted to help you. Mm. He said, look, I'm going to take you somewhere. And I said, where are we going? He said, I'm going to show you how to use the helicopter mount. Mm -hmm. And I was like, and I, because at the time I, I was going to be an assistant cameraman. And I was just like, people always wanted to help you. Yes. It seemed like people always wanted, even like at CBS, some of the some of the black folks at CBS, they were like, especially Ed Bradley. Mm. He said, yo, let me tell you about how to really do it. Let me tell you the real secrets. And that was something that happened all my life, and I think if you put yourself in a position where, you know, you are a good person, and you're really trying, I think that people reached out. Reached out for you. And also, some of your work uh, was featured in films by Spike Lee, the Bill Cosby Show, 227. I mean, some of your artwork really was nationally and internationally recognized through the media level, so how did that all come about? By surprise. Okay. I mean, things kind of just happen. I think that when you're doing things positive, things good happen. Uh -huh. And I remember when Spike was doing Mo Better Blues, there was a, a woman um, who had just started, she had worked at CBS, and she said, look, Mike, I know you're doing this incredibly big jazz series, and Spike is doing a piece on jazz. And I just said, you know, and he said, why don't you just bring down some work or get some slides and show Spike people, his, 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 his scenic director, you know, some of your work. It's, I know that they can use it. Mm -hmm. And I just said, oh, stop. Back in those days, you had to put a portfolio together. You had to, you know, photograph. And that, it was a time-consuming situation. So I just said, look, I'm going to put together what I got and then I'm just going to bring down 13 paintings. Mm -hmm. And if they like them, they like them. Then after that, I'll just pay for the cost of the truck and that'll be it. Mm -hmm. But by the time I got back home and they said, look, we're using all 13 paintings. And I just said, oh, wow, that's the first time I ever got work on uh, on, on um, in the movies. Right. And they said, oh, this is fabulous. This is great. And I felt one that felt like I was on top of the world. And... Um, I mean, I got a chance to get in and go to the red carpet thing with the, I went to the parties and mm -hmm. the the thing with Bill Cosby, I, I, I had a house in Westchester and it was like about four do doors down from Felicia Rashad and I had knew Debbie Allen who was her sister. Mm -hmm. 
And, um, you know, when the Cosby show came out, nobody knew that that show was going to hit the way it did. Mm -hmm. And then when it hit, she got famous, everybody got famous, and everybody that knew that got famous. And mm -hmm. I just said, listen, I want to put some artwork on that show. And they said, we'll give you the scenic director. And then that opened up a whole new different thing for me. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I just started saying I was on this wave where all of a sudden, you know, a lot of work that I was doing, fortunately, was accepted by some a lot of television shows. Mm -hmm. The Guiding Light, I, I kind of just knew the people that were in theater and film because we all were like one family anyway. Mm -hmm. And there was, the most surprising thing was um, The Guiding Light, I think. There was a, uh, an actor who they wanted some artwork for his room, Hamp's room. Um, and they just said, why don't we use your work? And I said, yeah, why don't we just do this? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden it happened. So no, so no doubt about it, your work was good to the borderline of actually being great, but also people started to know that you were an artist, that there was a lot of things that you was um, involved with with your artwork. And it just seemed like to me, you was in that circle and then the famous people like Bill Cosby and other you know television shows and movies like Spike Lee, did they just come at you or did you have to kind no, of go No, it, it was a combination. Combination of both? You know, you just do what you got to. I mean, things just happen, but I don't think things just happen. I mean, I think that things ha happen, and if you look and you observe it, mm -hmm. I mean, there was a lot of things that happened to me if I didn't jump on it when I did, mm -hmm. I would have never got there. Right. I mean, people would just sit down and they would say, you know, look, so-and-so was looking for so-and-so, and I, I didn't hesitate. I just picked up the phone and called. and. Mm -hmm. I found, and plus, I wanted to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, our great influence was Ernie Barnes. Right. I mean, you know, the thing he did with Sugar Shack, with uh, Good Times, mm -hmm. it was just fantastic. Because I just said, you know, you can actually put your artwork on television, television. or you can put your work in film. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that Avenue was open to us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I didn't like the, the character of JJ. Right because it hurt me in terms of like, you know, the perception of his art was just not good. I mean, I, I, I can tell you, I can, dude, that's a whole new... But it, was a, but it was actually Ernie Barnes that did most of the painting for J.J. Wasn't that kind of accurate that Ernie Barnes Yeah, was he Ernie... No, it wasn't the art that, oh. that disturbed me. It was the character of, of the J.J., the J.J. character. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's because... They, I mean, and that, that's only because... Um, I mean, there was a couple of jobs that I knew that people didn't take me as serious as an artist, and a lot of them were influenced by that J.J. character. Well, what about Norman Lear? I mean, Norman Lear had a lot to do with putting those type of shows like All in the Family, uh, Maud, Good Times. They were, they, those shows were all spinoffs of All in the Family. And you're telling me that you really didn't like the character of J.J., but I don't know if you remember, before Good Times actually got green lighted to go into action they didn't actually want um a father a black father in the household and they wound up getting it dude. that's because esther roll said she would not do the show right unless they had a black father right, right. in the show right so i mean there were some things that actors had to do to, to take a voice for themselves. yeah and um we can go on a lot about entertainment yeah. i mean i wish we had some more time to really get yeah. to that next level uh, I might just have to have you come back sometime yeah, do just to talk about entertainment. That's the role was a wonderful, 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 strong people. But there were strong people in all the industries, um, uh, art, and they, that, that were just strong and they wouldn't tolerate it. I mean, Benny Andrews was one of them because he ran the protests uh, uh, against the Metropolitan Museum of Art because there was no black people involved in, in anything, mm -hmm. any area, whether or not it was management or anywhere. Mm -hmm. and, um, but there were people that stood up, and I think that was important to be able to see people stand up. Mm -hmm. And I to be able to see people like the Martin Luther King types and uh, the Malcolm X's that stood up and said, no, we ain't gonna deal with this. And that, oh, that made me a much, much stronger person. And that was what I lived by. Mm -hmm. And I lived by the whole idea of 
you you got to fight and you got to just say no every now and then to whatever the situation is and i try to do that all my life mm. Well, I really appreciate those last words. And again, I really wish I had a little bit more time to really extend this conversation, but it was an honor really to have you on this morning. And I really appreciate you driving up here from New York City to be a guest this morning well, on, on my show. Well, it was an honor and I, I was honored to be here. And right. also, uh, the Spectrum Gallery, we can't leave them out because <laughs> Spectrum is put this together and uh, uh, I think that they did an incredible, incredible shit. It was just so surprising to me that I had a Soho type gallery up here in Centerbrook. Okay. But the thing is, it was just great because I didn't expect it and they, the gallery is just so wonderful and the work is there. Mm -hmm. All right, well, like I said, maybe I'll probably bring somebody in the future from, from the gallery to kind of extend okay. it a little bit beyond. Okay. But I really had um, enjoyed great. having you on this morning. My real pleasure. Mike Singletary. Thank you so much. Okay, this is Jonathan Small. I definitely enjoyed hosting this program this morning with my guest, Mike Singletary, and I hope everybody enjoyed his conversation about his life. And as I say every single week, there's a lot of great programs you could always look at on accesstv.org network. And as I also say to everybody out there, have a very blessed day and keep the faith. Thank you.